All right, hi everybody. Welcome to the last panel of this year's New York City Food Waste Fair. Um, before we get started, I wanted to give a few reminders. Um, one, please use the Q&A function to submit questions for our panelists. They have a lot to say um, and a lot of experience, so definitely uh, make sure you exploit that resource. Um, other reminders I wanted to give, um, unfortunately our interpreter will not be able to make it today and I, and I apologize for that inconvenience, but I just wanted to let folks know. Um, I know we promised one, but um, he dropped out um, very last minute. Um, the other reminders I have, um, please check out the Food Waste Fair website. Um, this might be the last panel, but we had a very great schedule of panels um, this past week. Um, and all of those panels, including this one, uh, were recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So you should check those out. Um, you can find that um, at foodwastefair.com uh, where you'll also find our speaker bios. Um, also, don't forget to check out the Food Waste Toolkit at foodwastetoolkit.com. It's a resource that we've put together for New York City businesses and residents to learn about how to reduce their food waste. Um, and without further ado, I would love to introduce Allison Shapiro, uh, our wonderful moderator for this panel. Um, and I can't wait to see this conversation. Great, thanks Sam. And thanks all of you for joining in and what is hopefully one of your final meetings before the weekend. 
we are going to spend, let's say 55 minutes together trying to frame the issue of food waste across the supply chain as it, as it pertains to packaging and also packaging waste across the food supply chain. I'm joined by an illustrious group of experts in their field spanning retail, uh, package developer in kind of um, edible format, package developer in inedible format, and the science of packaging uh, and, and its impacts on human and environmental health. So without further ado, let's introduce ourselves and get into questions. My name is Allison Shapiro. Uh, I work at Closed Loop Partners, which is an investment and innovation firm building circular economies in North America and beyond. Let's go in alpha order and we'll have Adam introduce himself next. Thanks, Allison. Hey, I'm Adam Farbiash. I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Deliver Zero which is um, a big partnership that spans over 150 restaurants in New York City, um, um, where we work with these restaurants to get them to use and share uh, reusable packaging for their delivery and takeout orders. Thank you, Adam. Over to Anna. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anna Steffens. I'm Associate Director of Sustainability at Appeal Sciences. Appeal Sciences works with nature to help reduce food waste by creating an extra barrier uh, plant-based material that can help protect fruits and vegetables from uh, going to waste by extending the shelf life, keeping water on the inside and oxygen on the outside. Uh, so we have uh, solutions for a variety of different produce categories, everything from citrus to avocados to uh, cucumbers, which is a plastic-free English cucumber. Thanks, Anna. And Adam and Anna will get into exactly what your companies offer in, in a couple minutes. Over to Claire. Hi, uh, happy to be here. Super excited. Uh, so I'm Claire Sand, and I'm owner and founder of a company called Packaging Technology and Research. And so basically, I work at the juxtaposition of food science and packaging science. So I'm a scientist. And uh, I got passionate about food waste when I was an undergraduate at Michigan State University. And uh, it's it's you know, gosh, unfortunately still there, uh, but uh, there's a lot we can do and I'm uh, super excited about this. Uh, so I work with food companies and I work with packaging companies to extend the shelf life of their products, which of course uh, relates to uh, decreasing food waste. So happy to be here. And I think this panel is just a wonderful group of people. So nice work. Thank you, Claire. And last but certainly not least, Sandra Newman. Hello, everybody. I'm Sandra, Chief Sustainability Officer at Just Salad. Just Salad was uh, founded in 2006 in New York City. Our mission is to make everyday health and everyday sustainability possible. We operate across six U.S. states and we run the world's largest restaurant reusable bowl program to keep uh, food container waste out of landfills. Excellent. So my next question is after this next question is going to be how each company and organization we have represented tackles this problem a little bit differently, but why don't we start framing this question for those newer to the sector by asking where does food waste occur along the supply chain? Um, if, I could, if I could suggest maybe Anna taking kind of upstream, Sandra thinking about retailer and consumer experience and Adam retail and consumer experience. So Anna, over to you. Yeah, um, as you noted, Allison, there's food waste that occurs at a variety of different places, everything from the field um, to at the processing facility um, uh, to retail locations and ultimately at consumers' homes. Um, for Appeal, what we work to do is, is see how with the Appeal coding, we can help reduce waste, particularly at, at retail levels. And we've shown that with the extended shelf life of produce, that can help, help reduce food waste by up to 50%. Um, so we see the, the waste occurring there and then the packaging waste is often um, in terms of the uh, shipping containers being used, um, but then uh, yeah, the packaging also carries on uh, at home. Thank you, and I should specify food and packaging waste. Um, all right, how about uh, Adam and then Sandra? Yeah, um, our focus um, in Deliver Zero is, is the packaging part of it. Um, I don't know if you saw the report yesterday, Allison, that Upstream put out, um, where they estimated that a trillion individual pieces of, of stuff, forks and knives and spoons and containers, um, uh, we go through every year in the United States, that I say the restaurant industry goes through every year. Um, a lot of that stuff um, can be avoided if you say, hey, I don't want napkins and I don't want forks um, with my meal. 
Um, but some of it, if you're committed to takeout, um, can only be avoided with a reuse system. So we're trying to get that, that trillion number down to, I don't know, maybe a healthy 50 billion <laughs> or maybe even zero one day. Um, so it's a, it's a really, uh, the scope of the problem is really big and some of it we can solve right now through simple choices and some of it we have to think about bigger um, uh, systems like the Deliver Zero system. Great, and Sandra. The level of food waste, um, we think about food waste in certain buckets. So at a retail restaurant like Just Salad, you're going to have um, food waste generated during prep in the morning. So we serve fresh produce every day. We get it trucked in every day. There's a, there are two categories of food waste for us. There's the prep waste, which is the avocado skins, the, um, the root of the romaine lettuce, the inedibles, right? So the solution for inedibles is composting. We're getting them, um, to you know, scraps that animals could eat, for instance, getting the animals or farms. Then there is the edible waste. And the, you shouldn't really even call it that, the surplus food at the end of the day. So we try to be very disciplined about how much we cook, but it is impossible to predict demand perfectly on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's edible surplus, and we look at that waste stream in a very different way. We try to sell it at a discount um, for instance, um, or donate it to charity every day. Um, so those are the two um, categories we think of with food waste. And then with packaging, much like Adam, we truly believe that reusables have to be an extremely significant part of the packaging mix to get our waste crisis under control. And that waste crisis is very eloquently laid out in the report Adam mentioned by Upstream, and I highly recommend it. Great, Adam or Sandra, maybe you can put the link to the report in the chat um, while we're going. So now is an opportunity to talk about the work that your organizations respectively do to try to mitigate the packaging waste associated with growing, eating, and disposing of food. So why don't we start with Claire? Yeah, so we, we work with, um, as I mentioned, food and packaging companies. And um, you know, frankly, in terms of reducing packaging waste, um, a big fan of reuse, so I'm glad you, you guys are here. Um, you know, a lot of the low-lying fruit is gone. Uh, I had a conversation with a packaging company and they said, well, why can't we go after these opportunities? And I said, well, because, you know, they're not there, right? And so I really work with companies and what I can call, call um, like convergence innovation and system solutions. So the best example of a system solution that we have out there now is what we do in the meat industry. And so we can preserve meat for 12 to 16 weeks. Uh, using this master pack concept. Uh, and then by using that, consumers have less packaging to dispose of. So um, a, a scenario for that in, in the QSR world would be, um, you know, a, instead of having these little tiny chip bags, you would have uh, just paper chip bags that can be composted, recyclable, whatever, just uncoated paper, essentially. And then they would be put into a master pack with a controlled atmosphere package, low oxygen environment, so that the chips would last a long time in distribution, which is what um, you know big chip companies need. They need that, that long shelf life. But a consumer in a QSR environment only needs less than an hour. I mean, if I get a bag of chips, it's going pretty quick. <laughs> so uh, in that scenario, then um, the, uh, the QSR owner would unzip this bag, this master pack of chips, open it up, put it out on the counter, consumers would, would take them and, and the shelf life would be what, what consumers need. So that to me is it's less packaging. Uh, it reduces food waste, right? In this case, chip waste, but you could use the same concept with um, you know, anything really uh, that, that needs uh, modified atmosphere packaging. So it's less packaging, um, extended shelf life, and um, it's a systems-based uh, solution. Uh, that's just one example, but we, we uh, help companies implement those all the time. Thank you, Claire. Anna, how does Appeal tackle the problem of single-use plastic waste in food supply chains? 
Yeah, thanks, Allison. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that we look to is really understand, you know, what is the purpose of a package? Um, in some cases, it's to uh, create a grouping. If you've got cherries, for example, you you know you need to have them in a grouping. But um, what we found in the case of um, long English cucumbers, these are kind of the, the greenhouse cucumbers, is that the the plastic is needed to um, to help preserve that food. Um, without the plastic, it would really quickly rot um, and and create more food waste. Um, and uh, in terms of trying to balance uh, reducing food waste and reducing packaging, you know, the, the question is, you know, what if there was a better way? <laughs> what if we didn't have to have one or the other? Um, and so with Appeal, with our plant-based coating, we were able to, um, to apply our coating um, at a packaging, a, a pack house, and then remove that plastic. Um, and so for every uh, Appeal cucumber, that's the equivalent of saving about five straws. Um, and so it's really exciting to see that um, there can be cases where you, where you don't have to have waste or packaging, um, but you can have just, just pure, pure fruit um, and vegetables um, and, and be able to provide that to consumers. Thank you, Hannah. How about Adam? If you can tell us about, tell us about Deliver Zero's kind of solution and business model. I have a couple, I have a couple of ways that I talk about it. Given the crowd today, I want to, I'm going to talk about them. I'll talk about it in the more philosophical way, um, which is why we need a collective solution to the problem of waste and how actually a collective solution already exists. Um, if you go to a restaurant, if you go to a restaurant um, today, or if you went to a restaurant 50 years ago, you'd be eating off of plates that have been reused, that have been reused many, many times by many, many patrons over months or years who have been eating off of those same plates and putting those same forks in their mouths and drinking from those same glasses. Um, the reason that that works is because when you're done with your plate, um, it, it's, it's washed and it's given to a new patron. So whether you realize it or not, um, that plate is being shared among all of the patrons that have gone to that restaurant in the last you know, year or something. So our insight is essentially, why don't we make a city um, partake in that exact same solution? So that instead of all the patrons of a single restaurant sharing in the same plates, um, all the patrons of all of the restaurants in the whole city can share in the plates. Um, to do that, we have a standardized set of takeout wear um, that all the restaurants that participate in our network share. So whether you're a Chinese restaurant or a sushi place or an Indian place or a Mexican place, all the restaurants in our network share in the same um, uh, takeout wear. So that if you're a customer uh, ordering takeout from any of the restaurants in our network, um, you can get your food in that reusable, in that reusable stuff. Um, then rather than returning it to say just one kitchen, you can return it to any of the 150 kitchens um, that participate in the network. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Sandra. Um, so our, we have two solutions. Um, the, the one that many of our customers are familiar with is the reusable program that I mentioned earlier. I'll just grab it. So you uh, purchase this bowl, whoa, it's <laughs> fading out, for a dollar um, at an Aegis salad. And um, you bring it back. Uh, every time you bring it back to the store, you get a free topping. So we're incentivizing you with free food to um, go circular and go um, and ditch the single use. Um, the other program we're piloting, which is in my background, is a green, green bowl program that we call Bring Back. Uh, to New York City stores, you can order online, you can select bring back. And when you do that, um, you'll get your order delivered or for pickup in a reusable bowl. You can bring it back to just salad, drop it off, and it's gone. It's off your hands. We wash and sanitize. So similar to the Deliver Zero in the sense we're um, putting the responsibility for sanitation on the restaurant. And um, frankly, we think that a cocktail of solutions is necessary for di people's different contexts and lifestyles. That's why we partner with Deliver Zero at one of our stores as well. And really we're collecting data to see what's working and how we can optimize. Awesome, Sandra. And do you wanna share for how many years Just Salad has had a reusable bowl program that's leading the category in the country? 
Uh, since our founding, our very first store um, in 2006, we've had the, the blue bowl program I mentioned. We actually tried having it exclusively with the bowls, uh, the reusable bowls, but people threw them in the trash. <laughs> so we had to go and uh, offer both disposable and reusable. Thank you, Santa. Okay, so let's let's dream big. There's been a ton of innovation in the field of plastic alternatives for bioplastics. If you kind of actually create something that behaves like a plastic polymer to coated and uncoated paper, like Claire alluded to, to a peel, which is plant-based and edible solutions. So what categories of innovation are you seeing that you're each most excited about? And I will offer that, let's, let's think across the whole supply chain, including people eating at home who may be making prepared food and wanting to save it for a couple of days. This is open to anyone. I can uh, speak uh, to that, and I, and I think this relates to uh, packaging waste as well as food waste. Um, and, and this is um, it's something that, you know, with reuse, um, you know, as Sandra and Adam do, um, it's, it's top of mind, right? Um, and that's really that any discussion that we have on the circular economy with packaging uh, really needs to focus on the additives we use, converting raw materials and packaging. And because of that, or, you know, the, the reason this is an issue is we use chemicals, right? And so if we want to reuse the, the packaging, uh, we need to make sure those chemicals don't leach out. So when we approve chemicals for, for fit for use uh, in the United States, for uh, the FDA approves them for a specific purpose. And so we do need to make sure they're used just for that specific purpose, which is what's cool about Adam and, and Sandra's uh, thing, because they, they know what it's going to be used for, right? But when you recycle things, it gets a little more complicated, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's hard to track, right? Uh, and so we, we could have scenarios where, um, you know, unknowns uh, le leach out into our food. Uh, and so that's an issue, and that's also an issue with biodegradation, right? because we do have additives and the ASTM standards don't cover uh, all these additives that we have in our packaging, and they could be, and they do, uh, leach out uh, when um, something does, does degrade. So one of the things that that's ex I'm excited about is that we really have a, an opportunity here, uh, because we have a lot of collective knowledge of what's going on, what additives we use, um, you know, what happens. There's a lot of really cool science <laughs> behind that. And so I'm, I'm more positive now than I've been in the past in terms of dealing with these additives because the industry is really pushing forward uh, in terms of reuse, um, you know, getting rid of single-use plastics, um, you know, facilitating recycling and things like that. And so we're having that conversation as an industry that, that before we just didn't have on these, these chemicals of concern. Great, Claire. Anybody else want to chime in? What you're excited about? Um, I'm excited about um, the ability to sell surplus food in a more scalable way. Um, so at the end of the night, when we have um, surplus food, formerly there wasn't really a way to, um, at scale and, and with efficiency, um, put that surplus food um, to work. And today, we, that no longer is a problem because we partner with the app Too Good To Go. And we're the first big, at least health food chain to be on the Too Good To Go app. We sell our surplus food on that app every day across our New York, most of our New York City stores. And that has really helped us um, lower our surplus food and prevent it from going to the compost or the landfill bin. So I think that those consumer facing technologies are um, are useful and, and also exciting. Um, that's, that's one I've been personally involved with. Great. And Anna, if I can put you on the spot, can you share what, um, what aspects of plant-based packaging, um, you're excited about? And if you can even offer, suggest some, some materials that you're looking into for the future. Yeah, sorry, just a garbage truck going by. I was trying to hope <laughs> they backed up before I went back on here. Um, yeah, so with, with plant-based coatings, you know, it's really exciting and it, and it will be a consumer shift. And we've been trying to, um, you know, understand from consumers, 
to see, you know, when, when they see a cucumber now without kind of that shrink sleeve on it, will they still want to try to put it in a bag? And if they do that, um, you know, is that still, what's the weight of that bag compared to the shrink sleeve and kind of trying to do all of those different studies. Um, we can use a variety of different inputs into our plant-based coating. Um, uh, everything that's already kind of made from plants, from seeds to skins, um, and continue to uh, look for, for the best uh, method and that will change depending on the, the specific category we're working on as well. Um, uh, and then in terms of, you know, thinking about different solutions and technologies, I think from, from my perspective, the most important thing to think about is always um, reduction, um, you know, it's reduce, reuse, recycle. And I think there's often a lot of focus on, on recycling um, and people kind of just skip over that, that first one. And, and it, there, the order is important. Um, uh, you know, recycling is hard and a lot of people have access at home, um, for different types of materials. And when they do, it has to be trucked somewhere else. So there's a lot more steps that need to be taken to, to recycle something. Uh, but if you can reduce it from the beginning, um, and that's the type of technology that, that appeal offers and, um, by, you know, uh, thinning out different types of packaging um, or other things. I think uh, there needs to be a lot more effort into um, solutions that help reduce, not just um, swapping out a package to be um, more recyclable. And when we should still do that, but um, I think the emphasis should, should really be on, on the reduction phase. Awesome, Anna, thank you. And for those unfamiliar, there, the EPA, the US EPA is produced a food waste hierarchy. You can Google it and find it and reducing what you don't need to consume for product and packaging is at the top and then reuse and then recycle and recycle can also be extended to the topic of composting, which leads me to my next question. This is a question in chat from Eleanor. She asks, what are the barriers to shifting towards compostable packaging? Um, Eleanor, you also asked about other materials, but compostable packaging is a big enough topic. I wanna to stop here for a second and get our um, expert panelists thoughts on why there isn't more compostable packaging in market right now. I'd like to start with that if that's okay. Um, yeah, compostable packaging is, is intriguing. Um, one of the things that's the, the biggest barrier is uh, standards, right? Uh, we do have ASTM standards. We have all sorts of other standards uh, globally, but the standards, as I alluded to earlier, don't, don't really measure all of the additives, right? So, um, getting something to compost isn't necessarily, um, and it's, you know, to not top on the EPA hierarchy for a lot of different reasons. But one of the reasons is that we would put all these additives into our oceans. And so there's a lot of people who are super excited. It's like, well, gosh, let's make it disappear. And I would love to make that plastic disappear. But if you think getting a PET bottle out of the ocean is really hard, imagine trying to get all these chemicals out of the ocean that, that we cannot even see to the naked eye. So number one, we need standards. Number two, we need to be really careful about what we allow to degrade. Degradation is not a good thing uh, unless it's in a controlled environment, right? And then number three, I was a Girl Scout, right? And I actually am so geeky that I was an adult Girl Scout. And one of the things that we do with our little promise is uh, use resources wisely. Right. And frankly, I've done the LCA analysis on, uh, you know, reduce, um, which is, you know, number one, I agree. Uh, and I've seen them on reduce, reuse and recycle and then composting. And it's horrid <laughs> for composting because basically we're growing the world's, we're using the world's resources for, for growing something. Uh, we're polymerizing it, same amount of energy, whether it's bio-derived PET or, you know, fossil-derived PET. It's... Um, you know, it's, uh, it's the same amount of energy. And then we're using resources to degrade it. And one of the things that's interesting about the ASTM standards, we measure the amount of CO2 that's released in order to um, assess how much something is composting, you know, how much is composted. And CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So it really doesn't make a lot of sense. And then in the standards, usually it's two millimeters of size that's allowed and you and I, well, my, my eyes are aging, but I can still see down to two millimeters. And so um, there's a whole host of issues uh, regarding composting. One of the things I, one last comment is that when consumers are asked about compostable packaging, they actually don't like it, right? When, when they know what it is, what they're really talking about is bio-derived packaging, right? And so we can have bio-derived 
PET, we can have bio-derived polyethylene, we can have bio-derived, all sorts of bio-derived things that can then be recycled, right? Reuse first or reduce first, but recycled, but then we don't have to degrade them. Uh, why, why would we want to do that when, when we can reuse them? It, it, it really doesn't make any logical sense to me. So consumers really like bio-derived, but they don't really like biodegradable. Thank you, Claire. And I will um, stick a link in chat before asking this question of our other panelists to report that our Center for the Circular Economy published in December, explaining the differences between biodegradable, uh, compostable, and similar terms with initial thoughts on the state of research on actual biodegradability of different polymers. Um, Sandra, work. Anna, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll paste the link in chat. Um, Sandra, Anna, and Adam um, would love to hear your thoughts on the same question. We've talked to um, some composters in our markets and have also looked at the statements of public statements of composters and other markets. So what I mean by that is um, industrial composting operations. And we've asked them about bioplastics or read their statements about them. And the problem is that they're not uniformly willing to accept them. Um, they are in a difficult position of taking um, a waste haulers, you know, the, the waste, the, the organics that waste hauler sends them mixed in with lots of disposable utensils that, for example, that may or may not be certified compostable. And they have no way of knowing at, just by glancing at them, whether they're truly compostable or not. Furthermore, and so we've been told we, we landfill um, those types of items. Furthermore, we've been told that um, they don't like it because it's not great for soil quality. There's nothing in the bioplastic in particular that's enriching the soil that they're then um, in, in, that, in that soil amendment they're trying to sell to farmers. So even a wooden utensil, which we have tested with our consumers, um, composters that we contacted were suspicious of them. Even a, com a utensil made of pure wood um, they're just really, you know, they're very wary of, of the added work and, uh, and, and the risks of, of accepting those materials. So for all those reasons, we continue to think opting out and reuse are uh, the top of the hierarchy that they have to be. And uh, Adam, final thought? I'll just, add, I'll just add to that. I had very, very similar conversations, the one that Sandra had with, with composters who were faced with, you know, all this, this bioplastic feedstock and they don't want it. They don't know what to do with it. They usually just landfill it. If it goes into their feedstock, then the farmers don't want it. I just, it's, it's not, a, there, there's no real world in which the, the bioplastics are getting composted at, in a real, at a real rate, um, which leaves, you know, the real plant-based stuff, the, the brown stuff, you know, the stuff that's made from wheat straw or whatever. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not a scientist and Claire um, mentioned this and she could probably speak better to it, but the, the life cycle assessments I've seen on the brown stuff, which, which composters are willing to accept, you know, stuff made from straw um, is just, it, it doesn't support it as a, as, a great, um, as a great greenhouse gas emitter. What I have seen though is, is some references in the liter literature to folks who advocate that kind of um, the brown stuff that the feedstock that composters will accept say, oh, well, it's a really good vector for food scraps to get, um, to get into the compost. So that's sort of a footnote that I've seen thrown around by people who are still trying to hang on to the brown stuff is good for compost because it's a way of getting consumers to get that little food scraps into the compost bin, which is good feedstock and, and that stuff should be composted. But other than that footnote, um, you know, I, I haven't seen anything to convince me that it, it's, um, it holds a candle to, to um, opting out and, and reuse. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Adam. Um, I, I like how you said the brown stuff. That's that's really cool. <laughs> so um, what, what do you call it? I don't uh, know, you know. Yeah, and, I, and, and that's what I'm hearing. You know, um, I have a lot of clients who are super excited about compostables. And I think uh, compostables, you know, they have an application in a very defined environment, like a, a stadium, right? Uh, you know, what you can't reduce, what you can't recycle. Well, gosh, you could compost with, you know, the brown stuff with, um, you know, food scraps. Okay. You know, kind of like as a, well, if you can't do anything else with it, let's get to zero waste. And so, um, you know, but the problem is, you know, even things like, uh, 
you know, I'm not going to pick on paperboard, but, you know, that's just an example. Uh, we have, you know, the whole PFAS situation with paperboard. And, and so you could potentially, you know, PFAS doesn't degrade, you know, it's a fluorinated compound. And so, gosh, if, if somebody has a degradable uh, paperboard structure that unfortunately has PFAS in it, which the ASTM standard didn't even measure until last year, then it could get into the soil and then it's just a nasty situation. So I, I actually am, am heartened by what Sandra and Adam said that, uh, you know, composters are not accepting these because we just, it gets back to all those additives, you know, um, uh, we, we need to know what's in that. And if we're going to be adding packaging to composting, uh, we, we still use additives. If it's a degradable package, sometimes we use a heck of a lot more additives. So the thing degrades. Uh, so it's, um, it's incredibly complicated um, and not necessarily a, a, a good thing uh, to degrade. So. And, and for those um, wondering what PFAS and some other chemicals Claire has mentioned, those are chemicals of concern that are increasingly receiving consumer pressure for regulatory bodies and federal agencies to take a look at. There's, there initially was kind of a reflexive switch away from single-use plastics into either reusable plastics or, or paper-based alternatives. But if you make something that's really bio-based as functional as a plastic, if you can do that, there are sometimes some chemicals of concern that are toxic to humans and our ecosystems. That's the subject of another panel. And I wanna give you a chance to, to just ask, is there anything you wanna add either from your current role at Appeal or your prior role at, at Lidl at a retailer and thinking about compostable packaging? Yeah, thanks, Allison. I think it's been a great discussion so far, and I, I agree with everything else the panel said. Um, to clarify, yeah, prior, I didn't include my introduction, but prior to working at Appeal, I worked at um, Aldi, actually, um, in the corporate responsibility department, um, overseeing some of the, the packaging initiatives there. Um, and I think what, what some of the Adam and others were sharing about looking at the life cycle assessment is that it's it's, it's so important, you know, you can you can look at something in isolation and say, you know, technically this works, technically this could be composted, technically this could be recycled, um, but you really have to look at what's what's actually going to happen with throughout the, the cycle um, to to the to the landfill or to the composting. Will consumers be able to do that? Um, as Claire mentioned, kind of in a stadium, you know, that's confined. Um, but I think um, you know what appeal is is different it isn't a package it's, a, it's just a, an extra layer of, of peel you you eat it there's you know nothing going anywhere else um you can't you can't see it you can't taste it um but it's 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 there just as like a little bit of something extra to, to help that that cucumber stay um stay fresh longer without the need for for plastic um and so that that gets us really excited and we're um excited to see other solutions that um you know really take that that whole cycle into, um, into account, not just saying, okay, well, technically it can be composted, um, PFAS or you know, chemicals or other things as well. Okay, and I wanna, there's been two questions related to kind of how do you get businesses to change? And I wanna make sure we get that topic covered before we move on to some other topics. So if I can kind of consolidate two questions into one that I had thought of, um, in your experience, Sandra, at a retailer, Anna at a retailer previously, and now at a kind of, let's say, product producer, Adam at a product producer, and Claire in the role of advisory, can you each speak to what is most compelling to get you to change and who provides that compelling attribute? So let's think about consumers, policy, threat of regulation, et cetera. Anybody can start. Hey, Bob. Um, one that, and I, I was floored when a company said this. Um, we, I was working on a sustainability uh, strategy for, for a company and identifying what structures they should switch to to lower their, their life cycle impact. And I said, I'm just curious, like, why did, why did you start this? You know, wh why was it of interest? And they said, employee retention. And I said, what? <laughs> like, how, how does that relate? And their employees, basically, they don't want to work for a company that's got, you know, massive amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. And so um, I'm in my, I can't remember how old I am. I think I'm in my, my, my mid-50s. And so um, the uh, power to the young people. I, I love it, you know, empower to the entrepreneurs, you know, like, uh, you know, Adam and Sandra just, just say, yeah, we're going to do things differently. 
And so the number one thing that can get companies to change is people showing them, hey, you can do things differently because we have a lot of seasoned people in the packaging industry and the food industry and frankly, just opening their eyes, right? Um, is, uh, is, is what's needed. You, you can do things differently. And you know these, these young people in this case, in the, this company, they, they were gonna jump ship to, a, to another company. Um, if the company they didn't, they wanted, they, they were at, um, didn't switch, switch gears. And so incredibly powerful. Um, so I, I do have a lot more hope now <laughs> uh, because of entrepreneurs, but then also because of um, you know, the, the young people saying we are not going to stand for the situation anymore, um, really taking action. So, but Claire, I love that. We don't, we don't often talk about it, um, sustainability as an employee retention strategy if it's not core to the business model of a company, but I am hearing that uh, more often. Other ideas? I think for, from my experience, you know, it takes, you know, making a commitment um, and it takes experimenting, um, you know, there's not going to be necessarily one answer that will work in any given situation and, and seeing how consumers respond, seeing if signage can help, um, uh, try, trying things out. And that's the only way to, to really um, make progress is, is by saying, okay, let's, let's, let's try this, this new product or this new package. Let's put a sign on there and, you know, help consumers understand what's, what's changed and that, you know, it's, you know, the box is slightly shorter, but the volume is still as much, um, how, you know, and, and having that, that conversation and that dialogue, because we, you know, we know that consumers are, are interested in, in being more sustainable. We want to make it easy for them. And um, we don't want them to have to kind of compromise their, um, their ease of use for any given product. Yep, yeah, Andrew or Adam? I think easy is the magic word. Um, you know, when I try to get restaurants to use our product and you know package your your dispose your to go orders and reusables, um, I often start the conversation by saying, "Hey, you know how like all the takeout orders you get, everyone says I don't want any extra forks or knives or napkins," and every restaurant owner like nods along because that's true. Like they know that consumers have an instinct for this and have a feel for this. Not everyone, but a lot of people um, care about this. Um, the, the problem is it's, it's kind of hard to do. Um, it's kind of annoying, you know, our system is a reuse system. It's kind of annoying to have a container that you have to return. So everything we, we do as a business is, is predicated on the notion that once we make it easy enough, and we've already obviously seen great results, once we make it easy enough for people, people will opt into it. Um, and, you know, you can return your container to any restaurant. You can return your container to any delivery carrier. You don't have to pay anything up front for it. You can hold on to it for six weeks. Like, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Just return the thing eventually and return it in all these different ways. Um, because I think that, um, you know, I'm just one little company um, and it's hard for me to educate the whole world. I, I'm, I think that people are educated a lot already. They just need choices that are really, really easy. And it is a little bit harder than throwing something in the garbage and making it someone else's problem. And of course, it's, it's harder than that. But we can try to make it really, really, really easy. And I think that once it's easy enough, um, there'll, there'll be a sea change. Andrew, we're going to get to you in a second. But Adam, to give a little bit more specificity to our group today, can you talk about how Deli Deliver Zero tries to make this easy? Sure. <laughs> I didn't want to be all salesy, so I didn't, I didn't go through the whole process. But basically, the way it works is you order food through our website or through other websites. But let's say you go on Deliver Zero. You type in your address, you find the restaurants that deliver to you or that you can pick up from. It's sort of like Grubhub or Seamless or Uber Eats. You just order some food. The food shows up in reusable packaging. So the experience is kind of just like ordering through Grubhub. Um, then you got these containers. Let's say you ordered a bunch of food and you got six containers because you had a big meal. Um, you then have six weeks to return those containers and you can return them to um, the restaurant where you got them from. You can return them to another restaurant that's on Deliver Zero. Like I said, we have over 150 restaurants. Um, or you can order food again. Um, you can order food from another restaurant, from the same restaurant. And when the delivery guy is at your door saying, hey, you know, Allison, here's your new food. At that moment, Allison, you can say to the delivery guy, wait a sec, I have some old containers that I got from an old order, take them off my hands. And that delivery carrier will take them off your hands and return them to a restaurant where they're washed. So. Um, 
the, the easy part is, um, and you have six weeks to do that. The easy part is you don't pay anything up front. You have a lot of time to return it and you have lots and lots of different ways to return it um, because it's just too much to ask to get the customer to return it to the restaurant where they got it from in the exact same way that they got it. Um, so yeah, I think, that, I think that customer is already there. I think that you know, we're, all, we're all moving there as a culture. We all don't want those extra forks and knives and napkins. Every restaurant gets that on every order. That's old. Um, we just have to make it easy to get to the next step. Um, so, uh. thank you for that. And Sandra, Sandra is Chief Sustainability Officer at a at Just Salad with forty five odd locations and and growing. Um, she is in the position of having to make the business case for sustainability day in and day out. Sandra, what have you found to be most compelling to inspire change at your company? So. One, a couple things. Um, seeing evidence that our customers love the Reasonable Bull program is tremendously motivating to us. Um, so um, being able to show um, usage of the Reasonable Bull increasing monthly, um, we track it, is a big deal for us. Um, so seeing excitement from the customer. Um, but I will say another lever that we haven't talked too much about is policy. Um, at the federal level, Just Salad has advocated for the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act that would require producers to fund the recycling and waste management of their packaging. We've asked fellow restaurants to sign on to it. We've gotten about 40 restaurant brands to sign on. And the legislation also um, provides encouragement for the for reusables um, in several ways. And so I do think that policy has to play a role in spurring businesses to change. Um, but bringing it back to just salad specifically, when I can show my chief operating officer that reusables actually save us money um, or that a food, um, food waste reduction program is helping his PNL, which it does, that's icing on the cake. Um, and that always comes after. We always launch sustain the sustainability initiative to reduce waste, and then we do the PL analysis. Um, so it's, I, I'm sorry that answer is a bit all over the place, but it is, um, it is a multifaceted answer. Um, I am looking at, at the Q&A coming through. These are great questions. Um, I have one more of my own I'd like to ask the panelists, um, and then we can we can uh, take take your questions just to make sure we're covering this. So Sandra alluded to the importance of policy. She mentioned the Break Free from Plastics Act, which is one of the recent congressional bills introduced to try to uh, impose limitations and thereby create a funding and kind of an enforcement mechanism for this. Um, but can I can I ask each panelist? Uh, to kind of inspire our audience with what you, what one or two levers do you think would be most influential uh, in, in getting us to shift away from single use packaging? I can go. Um, I agree. I mean, I think there's a lot of different things we can use, um, whether it's, you know, a kind of creating industry collaboration and commitments and change policy. Um, but then I think, you know, making sure that everyone knows at the consumer level that they can, they can make choices as well, daily choices, simple things. Um, uh, we've launched a campaign called Unwaste Wednesday. It's um, more on, on the food waste side than on the packaging side, but um, kind of that, that weekly reminder of, you know, check what's in your fridge on Wednesdays and, you know, see what you can do um, to, I think I saw somebody in the chat, you know, make a frittata with something that's getting a little wilty. Um, but, um, but having that mindfulness, um, at the consumer level, that commitment at the, at the, the retail or uh, business level, um, and then that pressure at the, the policy level, um, combined can, can really drive change across, uh, across the country. Thanks, Anna. Magic wand levers, anybody else? Claire? There's a, there's, I think, oh, go ahead, Claire. No, no, go ahead. I'm just saying there's a lot of, I think regulatory stuff is really important. 
Um, and there's been, at the municipal level, the very local level, I mean, the, the national stuff that Sarah, uh, Sandra's talking about is like so important. Um, but those are, those, are, those are bigger lifts and um, important players like Just Salad can make those asks. You know, it's, it's, it's often harder for, um, for a private citizen to make those asks and to, to advocate in that way. Private citizens can make the choices that I was saying, but they can also, um, they can also petition their local governments. It could be your, your local city council member in New York, or it could be the mayor of your municipality. Um, and there are lots of municipalities throughout the country that have done very cool things to, to, to tackle uh, packaging waste. It could be a 25 cent tax on single use coffee cups. I think that's in Berkeley, California. Um, but it could also be tax incentives. Um, if you participate in the bonafide reusable program, you get $500 off of your sales tax. Um, there are lots of cool levers that municipalities throughout the country are, are pulling to, to get um, businesses to participate in reusable programs or to get them to, to move away from single use. So, you know, that's stuff that you can really make your voice heard at the local level and um, the, the proof's in the pudding because the municipalities are receptive to that. Yeah, I, I agree with Adam. Um, I, I had a good friend, we were talking about politics in general and it's all local, Claire, you know, and it is true. I mean, you know, when you think about just dis disagreements in your family, right? Well, those, you know, we have those on a local level and then when national level, state level, things at the global level. And so I do think that these uh, local legislations are, um, some of them are not mm, so positive, but but some of in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and things like that. But but I think they're really showing that people are not going to put up with things anymore. So um, one of the things, if I had a magic wand, um, I would um, cast it uh, to industry and uh, just say stop doing these material wars. Right? It's it's not about. The, the paper people dancing in the streets when something bad happens to the plastic people or the metal people or whatever. Uh, it's not about that. And that, you know, we as an industry and, and pa packaging industry really need to, to look deep down inside and say, gosh, we shouldn't have done that 25 years ago, <laughs> right? But now uh, let's, let's regroup, right? As an industry and let's gain, let's, you know, Let's, um, let's act responsibly and let's regain uh, consumers' faith, right, in, in, uh, in packaging. You know, right now, when I graduated from Michigan State in 86, I was called a garbage producer, right? So that was a wave of sustainability. That was the fourth wave of sustainability. Now we're like at 4.5, right? So how many waves is it going to take, right? um, you know, until we you know, get it caught in the undertow? And so um, I, would, I would cast a wand and, and tell the industry to stop fighting. Uh, and I think that's sort of happening. We're seeing industry people uh, at, be advocating for EPR, which is what you know, Europe has had for years, uh, um, advocating for bottle bills, which in the past they had not advocated for. So we're seeing a lot of positive energy, uh, but I wish I uh, had a wand if anybody has one. Sandra, other thoughts besides policy? I think um, I think about this question a lot, and I have been reading some books and studies on how social change happens. Because um, for reuse, a future in which reusables are the default seems very far away in some respects. And on the adoption curve, we're still in the early adopter phase, right? The vast, the the majority in the middle isn't. Uh, pursuing a reuse lifestyle. Um, and I think that one insight I've gained from my research into this is that policy creates the, the system's change, but that policy won't succeed without grassroots support. So we need communities of people in cities um, and, and municipalities pushing, pushing policymakers to prioritize legislation that favors reusables or reduction of single use. Um, so if you're trying to create that future, I think that you have to think about joining that uh, grassroots movement and you can do that perhaps by forming a green team in your workplace and asking 
them to seek a zero waste certification or work with a company that does reusables or order from Deliver Zero um, or, um, or join some, you know, some kind of group that does that. But you have to also model the behavior yourself in public. Um, advocating for it in the privacy of your own home or just talking to a couple friends about it is not going to drive the solution at scale. So I think we need to walk, be able to have, be walking into restaurants and see multiple people modeling this behavior so that the majority then sees it socially validated and says, I guess I should do that too. To the point where single use is as taboo as smoking has become um, or wearing a fur coat. So model it in public if you believe in it and advocate it at a grassroots level. Thank you, terrific suggestions, all of you. Um, there have been a couple of comments in chat related to food diversion or food packaging in um, food donation programs. Rather than addressing it here, because we've gotten together to talk more about packaging alternatives beyond single use, I will just offer that the Sanitation Foundation is going to put all of these sessions, which have been recorded online. There have been several prior sessions that discuss regulations related to food donation and opportunities and innovative business models that have arisen, in, arisen since the pandemic really um, kicked up in earnest last March in New York City to educate and inspire you. So I invite you to check the Sanitation Foundation website next week to address that topic. Um, we have five minutes to go. I think since there've been a couple of questions related to uh, reusables, since we are kind of focused on the higher level of the, of the, of the food waste hierarchy here, the food recovery hierarchy. Why don't we talk about something that's very topical? We are hopefully working our way out of the pandemic. How do each of you think that reusable packaging solutions or and in the case of appeal coatings in lieu of packaging completely can um, continue to be saleable in an era in which consumers are uh, perhaps more health conscious uh, about day-to-day -day, um, food and food-related packaging that they touch. I always answer that question by sort of saying what I said when I started, which is reusables are an old thing. And when you're eating off of a plate in a restaurant, that plate has been reused plenty. And we're comfortable with that. We're comfortable with washing plates and forks and knives. It's been going on for a long time. It doesn't get anyone sick. And once, once people open their eyes, they think, oh yeah, right, that's right. All the plates in this restaurant are, are reused and have, have been reused many times. People are okay with it. So it's really, it's, an ed, it's a matter of education. Because um, it is safe, it's perfectly safe to, to eat off of a plate that someone else has eaten off of. Yeah, restaurants have to adhere to very strict codes of sanitation. Um, so, you know, echoing what Adam said, um, we, 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 in, to stay in business, we, you know, we have to sanitize at a, at a very clearly specified level. Um, and we should communicate that better to our customers um, because um, it's not top of mind. But to use an analogy, again, Adams used the, the example of um, sit, dine in restaurants, but when you go to the dentist, the, the, um, the tools that the dentist uses have been used on other people, right? There's a system you trust that makes you comfortable. So the same thing applies to the standards of hygiene we have to observe in the restaurant industry. Yeah, I, th I think it's neat you guys both mentioned food safety because I was I was going to mention that. So that's cool. Yeah, for some, there's been a number of studies um, which have, you know, fortunately been debunked on uh, that. Oh my gosh, you know, um, you know, reusables. There's, there's all these food safety issues with them. And it's like I, I've always gone back to you know, like Adam said, well, restaurants have been doing that. We 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 wash dishes in our houses. <laughs> we, I, you know how. I know there are food safety, you know, protocols, temperatures, and, and things like that. But this is not uh, something that restaurants have not been dealing with. You know, you're just using this for for single use now. Um, you know, but they've washed bowls, uh, you know, large bowls and and, and and things like that that they've used in, in 
food preparation for, for a long time. And so I do think that um, what, what you both said is getting a, um, making consumers, making it just more blatant to, to consumers that, hey, this is safe, uh, because there's a lot of disinformation out there uh, about you know, reusables and, and lack of food safety. But I, I personally, as a scientist, I don't get it. Uh, but uh, it's it's out there, and um, it's um, it'd be good to address screw it. Yeah, we need to use all these analogies in marketing, I guess. Anna, any final thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, for for appeal, you know, it's it's plant based, but we have to abide by all the same kind of food safety standards as a wax on an orange or, you know, other things like that. Um, but we, we have done a lot of consumer research, you know, when we came out with our cucumber product, um, kind of right after the pandemic started and, you know, we know there was a lot of fear at the time of, um, you know, being able to kind of get COVID from packaging at a grocery store, other things. Um, but we were still seeing that, you know, consumers, um, preferred and, and were receptive to uh, a cucumber without plastic. And, you know, some might still put it in a bag, but we knew that that was still gonna be lighter than the original shrink package. And so um, kind of being on that journey and, um, you know, making sure that we're following all the regulation, doing our additional tests as well. Um, and, um, uh, you know, being with consumers as they're on this journey to experiment and, and try out different, different models, different packaging, different systems. Um, as we hopefully kind of go back to what Adam said of, you know, we've, we've been doing this for, for decades um, and we can do this again um, and we can have new innovation in addition to, to that um, so that we can all reduce our, our footprint. Great. All right. Well, we are at time. Thank you to my illustrious panelists, the Sanitation Foundation for hosting and all of our attendees for joining. Have a wonderful weekend. This concludes the panel portion of the Sanitation Foundation's third annual food waste fair. Take care and um, innovate with reusables in your own life. Thanks everybody. Thank you.